Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Uh, I mean, thank you to welcome me. I'm so glad to have you back at the Film Society uh, again. And um, we just spent, the audience here just spent the time waiting for the program to start by watching many of your early music videos. There's a great collection that's out. Um, okay. that, and we watched Side A. So we watched a bunch of uh, your earlier stuff. A number of Bjork videos came up, of course. Yeah, we did, we did many together. I wonder if, um, and we'll talk about, I want to talk about your music videos for just a moment, because I think it's an interesting way into the conversation, and then we'll talk about this new film as well. But I'm wondering about, this, uh, this time when I was watching some of the videos just in the back right now, I was wondering how your work in music video of informs or affects your work on feature films and whether you think about the connection between the two in terms of um, things that you try in a video that then make their way into the film. Are there examples of that? Or in reverse, things that you have explored in feature film, in the narrative uh, storytelling or feature film work that then we see back in some of your videos. Um, it's hard to answer because when I was shooting music videos, I had no idea that I would eventually uh, direct movies. Really? Um, I just I remember the moment when I thought I uh, should try it was when we did uh, Björk, Björk's uh, third video um, well, that was called Isabel and we shot it uh, on film like all the videos I was doing at this time, and we did the post-production film, so we could screen it on a big screen in a theater in London, and it felt so different to watch uh, uh, even a short piece uh, of film in, in a dark room with uh, quiet people versus on the TV uh, in the middle of, of many uh, other uh, uh, films that I thought that uh, even if I fail, I should at least try uh, to do a movie. Now to try to think of uh, what may have influenced my uh, work in feature film from the videos, maybe the way I approach uh, the actors uh, there is one element that I learned in doing music videos uh, is to deal with people uh, who have uh, fame uh, and sometimes a big ego and how to get friendly and to, um, to, to make them participate and uh, not fight against the process. And as well, uh, I always try to uh, film people like they were part of my family. I never wanted to sort of glorify them, like many directors uh, were doing when I, I uh, was doing videos, uh, or looking down on people like uh, if they were ants or, or sort of with a condescending look. So I always try to have a horizontal uh, relationship and, uh, and and framing uh, and uh, look to the the character as well as in my video or in my movies. So those are elements. And then I sort of developed uh, maybe a style, but I had to forget a little bit about it uh, when I started to shoot movies. When you make a music video, are the are the artists you work with, are they collaborators? Are they actors? Are they subjects? How does, or is the relationship different from artist to artist? It's different from artist to artist. Um, some like with, like Bjork are real collaborators. She brings a lot of visual idea. Some like Beck are really uh, just trusting me with all the concept or the white stripe, for instance. <coughs> And um, I, I mean, I, th I think them as collaborator. What I, I imagine I'm doing is trying to expand uh, uh, the song uh, into the visual, uh, the time I have uh, on screen. So, because when you talk about, you start a story in a song, you don't have, in the three minutes you have, you don't have time really to express everything uh, you have in mind. And I try to guess what they have in mind and express it in this 
three minutes I have as well. I, it might be my age, but when I think about music videos, they're so influential with how I discover certain artists or certain music. So my relationship to the music is sometimes very much connected to the music video, especially, you know, as a kid growing up watching MTV, watching so many videos when MTV used to show videos. Um, but I wonder now if, if, I wonder what you see the relationship between videos and music today, whether it, there is that same relationship through YouTube where most videos are seen millions of times, or if it's not the same? Well, the size has changed. Yeah. And uh, I think that worked in the advantage of director like uh, Spike Jones or myself or other that were not focused only on the visual and the precision and, and the sort of uh, shyness of the image, uh, but more on the concept or sometimes on the humor. And I think we made the transition because uh, all those directors that were really focused on the more on the surface, I mean, I don't want to be condescending because some of these videos were amazing. Uh, and some of these directors become one of the biggest, some of the biggest film director now. But this type of video are not, can't longer exist because now you see video on a small, very small square. So you have to go uh, to get something across that is different. So, but now it's hard to, uh, to answer the other part of the question about the relationship of the music and the music video now versus before. Uh, I think, of course, in the MTV uh, uh, award, uh, MTV time, uh, it was very important. But if you see the beginning of MTV where the video were, uh, uh, the videos were appreciated for as an art form or as something at least. And just a few years later where the video was just a, a pretext. Mm -hmm. the, the artist who, who was like the director of the video, basically. Mm -hmm. He was given a word and uh, the video didn't really count. It was really the song that was... Uh, yeah. So here already it was a shift. Yeah. Well, we'll switch gears. We'll shift uh, the conversation to talk about your new film and then we'll go back again in a minute um, to talk about some of your other work. Um, tell us, uh, a few people in the audience have already seen the film, but many people have not. It's playing again tonight at 9 o'clock. Um, it's the story, it, it's, it's such a wonderful film, and I love the two, uh, I love the story of these two boys. There's just such a, an incredible exuberance of youth that is on display in this movie, and um, these kids are so ingenious and clever and reliant on each other. Um, tell us where the idea for this relationship between these two young kids came from? I think they're clever, but they're stupid at times as well. <laughs> that makes them funny, I think. Uh, well, uh, I came back to uh, some memories of uh, my t teenage years. And I was, I, want to, I wanted to explore why. Uh, I mean, I was coming from middle class, sort of hippie, uh, very uh, relaxed family. Um, and at school I was not really, uh, I didn't want to mix with, with the boys. Uh, they were, uh, uh, too, uh, sort of, uh, stereotyped, aggressive, uh, and I, always, uh, I was mostly friend with girls. Uh, and the only guys I was friend with was uh, rejected of the class and this happened even before when I was uh, in a small school uh, where we at this this time we were not mixed with girl yeah. I was always befriend the guy who was like the, the everybody that would be the guy that everybody mocks and uh, those guys were coming from sometimes very poor uh, uh, background uh, and they are very uh, weird uh, uh, uprising the difficult parents but they <coughs> and they were not necessarily very uh, proper mm -hmm. but they had something very uh, different and uh, and uh, uh, original uh, and that's the reason why they were rejected mm -hmm. so I 
I started to think of, yeah, it's true. All the over the years, th my best friend was this guy. My other best, next best friend was this guy. And my best friend was this guy. They were all the reject uh, of the class each, each year. And I, in exploring that, I started to collect memories. And that was basically the first part of the film, uh, up mm. to the beginning of the, the trip. Mm. It's really uh, very close to reality uh, on, on both sides. And, and Daniel, who is more me yeah. and the shy one and the other one who tries to be funny uh, uh, and is sometimes but sometimes not uh, that was uh, he represent a very good friend I had at, at this age when I was 14 uh, um, so all that is very autobiographical bio can you say the word autobiographical thank you uh, to the point we even shot in a, in the house of my grandparents who Really? It's identical to the house I, I used to live because it's the same garden and it's the same construction and everything. And from so we had this relationship and it was uh, good with mechanics. And one day we decided to build a car, but we didn't do it. So in the movie they did do it and they have this trip. So you get to finally live out this intention you had of building. Yeah, this exactly. Car. I thought the film would be a good uh, way to a good medium to to uh, fulfill your your dream. Um, tell us more about how you grew up. Where, where you, you mentioned a little bit about how you grew up and where you grew up, but tell us, I, is, it's in France, but where was yeah, it? Yeah, it was in Versailles. Yeah. Uh, that everybody knows because of the castle and it's a very conservative city. Yeah. Uh, but we were not necessarily very rich. We were very middle class. Uh, my grandfather was an inventor. My parents were playing music, more or less. So we were... I had a sort of an artistic background. Um, it was a small house near to the forest, uh, so a lot of element to develop my imagination. And very early on, I was uh, good at drawings and making things, so I was always uh, considered like the artist of the family. Uh -huh. So I had two brothers. Uh, I mean, nothing really special. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, my mom liked Debussy, my father liked Duke Ellington. <laughs> I liked the rhythm and blues. Did they encourage you? Um, did they encourage you to be to express your creativity, or did you just kind of find your path and then? No, they, they were they were very it. nurturing to my creativity. Uh -huh. Uh, Were you drawing first? Was that your first kind of e yeah, expression? Yeah, that was my main way to, ex to, to express myself. Uh -huh. But remember, much later on, when I uh, did my first feature, Human Nature, uh, my father, um, is, he read bad reviews, and he said, maybe make movie making uh, is not good for you, it's going to hurt you. And say? then he passed away uh, before I, I, I did my second movie. But it was interesting. And sometimes I think of, of uh, what he had said to me. And I'm glad I didn't listen to him. But uh, uh, that it's intriguing. Did you... I love Human Nature. I think it's a terrific film. Oh, thanks. Um, it's really, really great. I've watched it many times. Um, did you, in between that and Eternal Sunshine... Did you ever think about not pursuing a feature film career? Or was it something that you just knew you wanted to continue to do? Well, when we, s we shot uh, Human Nature, Charlie Kaufman uh, was already writing Eternal Sunshine. Okay. So th that was not a question. I yeah. mean, I managed. Uh, Maybe until now, because I don't, I'm not in this configuration now, but I manage uh, most of the time to have a project uh, on the tracks while I was shooting oh. the current project. So I would not have this moment where I don't know where to go in between. Right now you have nothing that you're working well, on? Well, now I don't know where to go. <laughs> really? <laughs> A little bit. Was I, I mean, I have some clues, but... Uh, yeah. Was that... Um, you went back to shoot this in the place where you grew up. It's a, it explores aspects of your own childhood and expression of things that you wanted to do as a kid. Um, 
but you've also made movies in America, in either the big studio system or independently in this country. Um, to what extent do you think about um, where, uh, where you're making movies and also how they're being financed? Is that something that is a strategy or is it something that is just project to project? Because I'm finding it interesting that you decided at this moment to go back home, as it were, and, and explore this story at this moment in your career. I mean, it's, I don't think there is a, a, ever anything calculated. Really? I mean, after I did Beacon Rewind, I realized that I, all the films that were uh, sweated, like copied, yeah. were big block, blockbusters. Yeah. And I thought I would be nice to try to do one myself. Mm -hmm. So I did The Green Hornet. I'm not saying that it was a big blockbuster, but at least I tried. Uh, and uh, like for uh, microbe and gasoil, uh, microbe and gasoline, yeah. uh, I just had uh, worked very hard on the adaptation of uh, Les Cumes des Jours, uh, uh, Maud Indigo by Boris Vian. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to free myself from existing material. So yeah. I wanted really to tell about my, uh, write my own story yeah. and, and just have uh, myself to, to do it. I mean, uh, of course I listened to people's advice and so on, but that was really my own story. Was it rewarding? Um, yes, I think what was rewarding is to find these two great actors, so those great. two kids, and the fact that they uh, recreated this story that was partially true. That was the most rewarding uh, thing, because I think the story was pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, and only if I had a good cast, uh, the film would work. And I think I had a good cast. Was it hard to find the boys? Was it hard to find these kids to play yeah, these Yeah, we spent a lot of time with the casting director. We sent a lot of people everywhere in Paris to to talk to kids uh, everywhere in the street at the end, uh, at the end of the class uh, at school and, and yeah. so on. And what's great is when you do such a wide range casting uh, uh, is you pick the one who is exactly right for the role. It's not like when you cast a star and yeah. you bet, uh, uh, you take your chance. You make compromises maybe. Yeah, you make compromises sometimes. And I, but I, I mean, I don't want to, in French you say spit in the soup. I mean, I, I, I don't want to criticize the system because right. I've been using it. Yeah. And uh, some of the actors are great and I'm happy to see them again and again in movies. Yeah. Uh, but it's true, you take a chance uh, because they don't read. Uh, yeah. uh, so you have uh, to uh, imagine them in the role uh, and, and go for it. As when you shoot with non-famous actor or unknown actor, they, uh, they read and, and then you, you talk with them, you get to know them, who they are. Uh, and then you find little element in them that you start to imagine how they can act. Some uh, Theo, the older one, yeah. had some f one film as an experience. He had yeah. shot uh, a movie uh, two years before or three years before. And the other one, uh, the younger one, had never shot a movie. Uh -huh. And it was hard to imagine him acting in the beginning, but his personality was so endearing yeah. that I kept trying. And in the beginning, he has, he has taken a few th uh, theater lessons. Yeah. And that went completely wrong. That came off completely wrong. So I try uh, to, to change that. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, it turned out to be great. You've also made some terrific documentaries. Um, in that case, the, the idea of casting is very different because you might be working with, say, Noam Chomsky or maybe someone in your family. Um, how do you find the process of documenting someone but still having this very close relationship with them, mm -hmm. this collaboration with them? A documentary is, is in many ways a collaboration, or it seems to me a collaboration between a filmmaker and a subject. Um, how has that kind of dynamic affected the way you look at feature work or, or well, vice versa? Well, it both versa? helped, but, but first of all, when you 
the motivation is different. Yeah. When you meet somebody like uh, Noam Chomsky or my aunties, they are the same age. They are about 87 now. Yeah. Uh, and they are very important to me, both of them in a different ways. Yeah. Uh, my auntie, uh, she lived uh, all the second half of the 20th century uh, and she was a school teacher in very small school and she lived a lot of part of his French history uh, because she taught uh, uh, people uh, who escaped from Indo China or uh, the uh, Algeria war and mm. then she she lived through uh, when in the 70s everybody left uh, countryside uh, to go to, to Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and of course Noam Chomsky, who is uh, one of the greatest thinkers alive. Uh, I had this feeling, this urge to record something from them before they, they go, mm -hmm. before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one motivation. Yeah. And, um, and obviously, get people to listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another motivation. But what I find interesting in, uh, and I did a uh, blog party with Dave Chappelle, who was the sort of documentary as well. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing with the documentary is like you have no idea what you're going to get. There yeah. is no script. The script is written as it goes. Yeah. And that's very scary because sometimes, uh, you just go there on the film roll and you, it, nothing is happening. Nothing interesting is happening and you yeah. think you're just wasting the film uh, on the time of the person. And then suddenly uh, uh, something great happened that sort of uh, reward all this anxiety yeah. that was there before. And But there is something that I learned in the process is to... Um, get surprised by what's going on. Okay. And I think I try to preserve that and when I went back to do movies, uh, to f leave room f uh, uh, to be surprised. Mm. So everything is not written, there is room for something unexpected uh, and that bit is gonna give uh, the movie uh, some air or some surprise, some breathing. Is that something that you didn't do? in some of your earlier films, like Human Nature, Eternal Sunshine, were you less, more resistant to surprise or not being in control? Well, I think between Human Nature and Eternal Sunshine, I uh, really made drastic decision on my way of shooting. Uh -huh. and try. And I, I was very strict on Human Nature. I wanted to respect Charlie Kaufman's screenplay word by word, yeah. and I had story about everything. Yeah. And I, uh, I felt I needed to be more, uh, uh, to surprise myself more and be m less uh, uh, in control. Yeah. So when I would uh, uh, shoot the scene of Eternal Sunshine, I, uh, I would walk on the, the morning of the shooting, not knowing where the character will be placed in the frame, really? which was a huge difference with human nature where I knew exactly where I wanted anyone to be placed. And so I, le uh, I, uh, I learned to leave more room to the actor on, yeah. on many other things, but that was one of the main elements. Okay. Um, I want to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions about your movies, your videos, Anything else that we want to talk about? So um, there are microphones. Raise your hand and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We'll start in the front row. So if um, someone could bring a microphone down here and we'll work across the front and we'll go around. You sure we need the microphone? We're recording the conversation oh, yeah, sorry, so sorry, people sorry. have to hear the... Uh, we'll go right here and then we'll work across. Hi, thank you Hello. for coming here and sharing all your words and wisdom. Um, so my question is, you put a lot of importance in the elements of your vision and your creativity. And so, for instance, one specific element, costume design. How do you feel, I rather, what is the kind of vision and tangible, I'm trying to think of like the right wording here, Basically, what is the kind of vision you feel in relevance to costume design within your projects? Well, it depends 
For instance, when I did Mood Indigo, there were a lot of uh, details written in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I paid attention to that. In general, I try, uh, and I know he might be disappointed. Uh, I'm sure you're a costume designer, but uh, <laughs> he might be disappointed for, uh, for a costume designer uh, that I really don't want to think of the color of the clothes. Absolutely. That no, no, no. But in regard to the, to the set, because I think in real life, when you walk in a room, you, you didn't plan. You didn't plan that you, you, you're going to walk in the red room so you would not wear a blue dress, let's say. So what I do in general is I ask my costume designer to see how uh, the, pr the actor we're going to use dress and, and start from there and then change some element. And sometimes uh, as well I ask uh, I ask them to take a small camera and shoot people in the street. Because basically, a lot of time you watch, you look at a ma um, fashion magazine and you say, oh, she, she should dress like that, he should be dressed like that, and so on. And uh, it, it looks contrived. I think in real life, people uh, dress a certain way. And if you want to reproduce the real life, then you find example how people... Uh, dress when they don't think if think about it too hard so i try to to make it as fluid as invisible as possible good question thank you jim uh, one of the things that's so impressive about this new film is that it's so normal and the boys are so normal we're, we're not used to seeing boys today portrayed in the way that these two kids are, and the way they, there's no phantasmagora in the film except there's that car that they build. So was, we, there's a lot of films about empowering young women, but there's very few films that talk about boys as boys, or at that particular age of 13 and 14. Can you talk a little bit why you held back on some of your more phantasmagora kinds of, of, of animation, and, which is not in this film? Well, after, especially after doing Mood Indigo, who had tons of that, I really wanted to come back to something very uh, straightforward. Like we shot uh, with my own camera, and we use only one lens, the, the 40 millimeter, uh, and I wanted uh, the framing. Uh, I didn't want to do camera held, uh, handheld. We had a small tripod, and I wanted really the filming to be invisible, to really focus on the personality of those two kids. And then they are normal uh, because I think, I think the way they speak is a little outdated because I wrote it and we tried to update it with them when we started to do rehearsal. But many films who portray kids of this age m tends to do a caricature of kids uh, the way kids speak at this age uh, nowadays, uh, and it doesn't really uh, last. After a few years, it, it looks a little dated, and I really wanted them to express true emotion, so on sort of the way I was feeling them. Uh, so they are a bit old-fashioned, but I think uh, the way they speak, mm, I hope, it's going to hold uh, with time. And the car, yeah, the car is uh, the only element which is a bit phantasmagoric, but it's the kind of things I would imagine at this age. So it's not in the way it's shot, it's what they are doing. And it's still about me, so I would still be doing that. But the way the film is shot uh, uh, is on purpose very, very square. And I'm going to bring it back to Mood Indigo because I thought you did such a fabulous job in sort of exploring that kind of magical realism of Boris Vian. Was it liberating to, or more uh, a difficult responsibility because you had the book to reference or did that make it freeing for you to do then all the visual experiments that you did? Well, uh, actually for Mood Indigo it was a, a very heavy weight to carry 
uh, because it's such a beloved book in France and everybody's read it and, every, and it's a very visual book so, so people have their own images. Uh, and I try to free myself by do in doing, uh, uh, by doing uh, everything I wanted to do. I, I had dreamed of doing uh, so I would uh, appropriate the the material and uh, and uh, and as well uh, when I grew up artistically when I started to be creative uh, I had read more Boris Vian's work and he was one of the inspiration I had you can see that maybe in some some of Bjork's videos. Uh, and so I felt that uh, it would be only normal that I just walk with my instinct to illustrate something, even if it was not literal. Early on in the new film, you kind of do some, get, you make us guess a little bit about Danielle's gender identity. Is he a girl? Is he a boy? We, do, we just don't really know. And then a little bit later, you jump to masculin, féminin, as if it's a little um, uh, wink to Godard. So can you talk about what you were going for in this, you know, this masculine slash feminine identity? Well, I didn't think of Godard at all for all the respect I have for him. It's just this kid uh, represent me at his age and I look like a girl. And at this age, that as basic as that. Uh, I mean, I had long hair, and many people thought I was a girl. And it was really uh, irritating, embarrassing. But at the same time, I felt that if I cut my hair, I would look like all those boys uh, from the school. So I was very uh, mixed up uh, about it. S and the, the, the shaving part, I mean, the second part of the movie is not really, it's uh, more the dream they couldn't achieve. But as well, when I was writing the first part, I had dreams. And those dreams I use at least in three or four sequences, like the plan, like the shaving, the American football. And, uh, they were really taken very precisely from dream I had while I was writing the first part. And I didn't try to explain them, but I thought to myself that maybe they are influenced by uh, me remembering my uh, uh, youth. So they, therefore they are justified and they, they must have some meaning, but I don't know what meaning it is. Um, you mentioned that when you worked on uh, the human nature, you already have been working on eternal sunshine. Uh, so is it comfortable, convenient for you to do multitask, to work on two projects at the same time? And my second question is, once you finish one film, do you feel this um, inner pressure, necessity to start a new project? Once, so once it's done, and like, oh, I need to shoot a new movie immediately because people are expecting from me something. Well, um, it's not the same involvement. When you work on a film, you can talk. I was talking to Child of Man on the phone, exchanging, exchanging ideas. And sometimes it just, uh, I mean, it's hard, it's hard and it's refreshing. For instance, when I was shooting the Green Hornet, it was really harassing. It was like so long, the schedule, and so physical. Uh, and in a, in a, I had a house in Los Angeles. And uh, in, in the evening, I would put my pyjamas on and I would sit on my little desk to animate. And that would be really refreshing and calming uh, in contrast with the day of shooting. So that was really uh, not a difficulty. So it depends on each project. And as for uh, what's going on in between film, after I did Humane Nature, I, had, uh, I knew that... Uh, that uh, Charlie was still writing uh, uh, Eternal Sunshine. Uh, but I had these six months of blank where I thought, I, okay, I, has no, I have no creativity left in me. And uh, I came back to do videos and I did two videos. And uh, I thought they were a catastrophe. <laughs> and they turned out to be quite good because one was a Lego one for the white stripes and the other is... Uh, for the Chemical Brother with, with a train window. 
But those videos, I remember doing them at this time and thinking, okay, I'm finished, I'm done. And right now I feel I'm finished, so I, I think of this moment and I think, okay, maybe it's going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, up there. Hi. Hi. Oh. Um, yeah, dibs. Uh, I, c I like that you talked a little bit about that feeling of creative exhaustion. So I guess my question is, do you feel that any part of your creative process or projects or whatever has changed as you get older or a basically aging? Very old. <laughs> um, I don't know. It may have changed. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I wish he had changed more, maybe, because I feel it's still the same uh, inside. Um, and I, the movie I just finished uh, is immature, but because it's, it's talking, and those kids who are speaking are immature. I mean, they're growing into maturity in some ways. So I'm able to make, to put words in their mouth. And, uh, but as if it was uh, a guy working in a bank or in a restaurant or an adult uh, dealing with his family, I'm not sure I would be capable of uh, writing the words. So I, I, I would need a screenwriter. So, in this regard, I didn't really change. Maybe at the, the last movie, on, on purpose, I decided, okay, I will not embellish anything. I'm just going to be straightforward. That was sort of an evolution to think, okay, I can just tell a story without putting any visual element in it. So, maybe that's an evolution. We have time for one more question. Uh, and we'll go all the way to the back. Standing up, the gentleman standing up. Hello, Michelle. Um, I just Hi. have a question regarding the music. What's your um, relation with the music when you deal with um, new projects? For example, in Science of Sleep, you have a constant song that he's always trying to sing to her uh, through the camera, through the dreams. So do you think of that before? Uh, what about the composition of a music? Or when you hear a song, you picture it? in film and then just doing what's the relation you have? It depends on the film. For uh, Human Nature, I had a friend, no, for uh, Science of Sleep, I had a friend who had uh, composed the theme uh, before we started to shoot. So I would play uh, on my headset uh, some of the music uh, in the beginning of the day when we were setting the scene and to to inspire me. Sometimes the music comes after. Um, the last film I did, uh, my mom, I wanted to, my mom was a great composer, is a great composer and she used to play the piano very well. And I wanted to use some of her music, if not only her music. And the studio uh, didn't like it, even though it was a f small movie, I don't have full control. So one day, so I couldn't use her music. So I have to find a composer uh, that was experienced uh, and so on. So one day I dreamt of Charlotte Gainsbourg, uh, who had been uh, in Science of Sleep. And when I woke up, I woke up with her mother's song, Diduda. Her mother was uh, Jane Birkin. And she had this song that was very melancholic and, uh, and with a nice rhythm to it. And I realized that uh, this guy who composed and wrote this song uh, as well uh, uh, had composed the full album uh, of uh, Gainsbourg, her father, uh, I mean her husband, uh, Melody Nelson. And uh, that was a guy, a composer called Jean-Claude Vanier. And I asked him to, uh, uh, and he was, for instance, a huge influence on Beck and many people through the Gainsbourg in the 70s. Uh, uh, a very specific sound of drum and bass, and I asked him to write the score for the for the movie, and, and he, he did a great job. But it's different; uh, it's a different experience each time. I want to thank uh, Michelle for spending time with us. It really is has been wonderful to have you here. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you.